Dominic. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Amy. I work at Red Hat. I'm a UX design lead in the middleware, middleware portfolio at Red Hat. And... Yeah, and I'm Thomas. Hi. I work in Barcelona in the three scale office, and there I'm the UX lead, and I'm also a manager part time. Um, and I give the word back to you, Amy. Okay, great. Yes, so we'll get going. Um, so, our talk is um, it's about how we, uh, how Thomas's team and our team has worked together over the last, oh, about a year and a half to um, bring together um, the design of a pattern fly of three scale into a more cohesive uh, UI um, using pattern fly the design system so this talk really is for anyone who has tried to coordinate um, and sort of look and present a similar and consistent look um, you know sometimes it works out and sometimes it's kind of like well it's close it's close <laughs> For us as uh, user experience designers and developers, um, this is in a way a, a kind of a holy grail. Um, it's something that we've reached for uh, for years um, at my former company, most UX designers who I talk with, who work for an enterprise um, in which applications are developed across the enterprise by different teams um, with different goals, um, different features. But yet still trying to look like they come from the same place in the same company. And obviously, we want to do that to make the user's experience one that is cohesive, coherent, that makes sense, and that is not jarring um, when one is switching from perhaps one system to another, which is behind the scenes two, behind the scenes two separate products, but we want to make it look as though it's all one cohesive unit. And of course, that helps when sales teams go out to demo the software. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you're demoing and something pops up that looks just completely different from everything else in your set. So how do we do this? Um, well, first of all, we recognize what challenges there are. Um, so first, in, in this uh, challenging enterprise environment, and a few of these things I've already spoken to, um, many applications that exist already, knowing in a large organization what is going on outside of your group, what even inside your group is going on with different uh, members of the team working on various projects. Um, teams have a variety of technology stacks and favorite tools that sometimes uh, are religious in a way um, in terms of their adherence to tools. Uh, legacy code, it's hard to change. It's, it takes time and it's often not favored over new features by the business. So businesses will often, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so they will not tend to favor, well, we need to align our UI, our front ends. Um, we have geographically distributed teams, which is uh, a challenge from a communication standpoint. And the teams themselves tend to want to focus on what makes their particular part of the project best in class. So how do we do it? We kind of have two, two areas that we look at. One is um, from a, an external, external to the company standpoint, um, marketing, branding, uh, storytelling that says, hey, this is an integrated solution um, and using our product will allow you to uh, work in this product and get your job done. But from an internal product design standpoint, we use what are called design systems and obviously communication um, amongst the teams. Now for Red Hat, um, which is an open source um, software uh, product, open source projects um, by their very nature are community driven, they're highly innovative, and they <clears throat> rely on different technologies, whatever the community is working on. They're not necessarily bound by the need for a common look and feel or a common behavior. But when those projects are then productized uh, as Red Hat products, we then have to grapple with how to make these uh, look more, look and feel more the same or the more similar, particularly when actions are similar. 
So um, for Red Hat, it became very obvious that we needed a, a system, a design system, to help us to take those kind of projects that are out there, community-driven, and create a more common look and feel. So what is a design system? A design system it, at the highest level provides guideposts and tools for creating a consistent look and feel. Um, they come with behavior guidelines and documentation. They include visual elements like fonts, icons, colors. They provide code elements. Uh, reusable HTML and style sheets, and um, in some cases, frameworks, JavaScript framework. Um, and uh, the design systems are really are living entities. They can evolve, they do evolve over time. And so, as many of you have probably heard, if you attended any of the UX talks yesterday, um, our design system is Patternfly. Patternfly uh, design system has been around for a few years. It is supported by a team of designers and developers. It is community-based. It's open for reviews, feedback, and contributions from the community. It contains tools um, that do make desi the design process easier and development easier, including a sketch symbol library, HTML and CSS sample code, and demo code, React.js framework, and artifacts. And the system is modular and has built-in accessibility. So I wanted to just take a step back and um, talk to you a little bit about some takeaways from a, a survey that I read um, that was done by Figma, which is a design system company. Um, the survey was conducted last year, included about 500 participants. Um, they wanted to see what kinds of themes were emerging and best practices around design systems. The practitioners who they interviewed came from a variety of industries, as you can see here, represented by their, uh, their company logos, um, from finance, education, retail, travel, and others. They used a mix of open-ended and multiple choice questions and uh, produced a, a document that I linked to at the end. And I wanted to um, just reference a couple of these outcomes because they helped to frame the rest of this um, talk. So the first big takeaway is that design systems are still in their infancy. The top chart that you're seeing describes uh, the current state of design systems for the practitioners who responded. And the bottom chart represents an aspirational where we would like to be. Um, if you look from left to right, the black is, is representative of stage one. It's an undocumented effort. Uh, the dark purple, stage two, is documented but in code only. The kind of orange mustard color is a dedicated design team, and then the light lavender is um, a system that's publicly available. So the big takeaway here is from the top chart, about 60% of respondents currently have undocumented or only documented in the code design systems. But if you look at the bottom chart, about 80%, that orange and the light purple bar, um, would like for their systems to be driven by a dedicated team and to have documentation and to be publicly available. So in the case of Patternfly, um, our system is in its, I think it's in its second major public release and it features a dedicated design systems team and documentation to support um, the, the, uh, the system. Um, the next the next question was, what stage did you start building a design system? And um, the key takeaway here is that design systems usually arrive after products are built, uh, whether they're derived from the products or not. Um, in our case, with Patternfly, uh, it wasn't so much a product or a project um, within Red Hat. It was more of a um, uh, built off of the bootstrap framework. Um, and so that was how 
how pattern fly got, had its beginnings and for several years um, relied on bootstrap. In recent uh, days or a year, the, in the past year or so, um, for pattern fly four, we've decoupled from bootstrap. So that w- is going to be helpful to us in terms of innovation, um, flexibility, and not being uh, tied to that, to their updates. Um, this chart looks at what are the artifacts that are part of a design system, and almost 90% of the respondents um, report using components and symbol libraries. About 83% report that their design systems include a style guide, and around half um, also mention content guidelines and design principles. Um, one thing that's not represented on the chart, but that's in this article, is that several of the respondents wrote in answers about code artifacts, and that seems to be an area where people are really engaging um, to provide more to developers in terms of what they need to actually implement these design systems. So things like React and Mixins and token repositories and iOS and Android artifacts and such. So um, I'm happy to say that Patternfly is really pretty far along in all of these areas and is also concentrating on code um, availability with a uh, React.js kind of gold standard implementation as well as the HTML and CSS libraries. And this was the last takeaway um, from the survey that I thought would be interesting to this group. Um, and the question is, does your, des- does your company let people diverge from the design system? And um, it, it, it does seem intuitive to me that design systems must be flexible um, and be able to breathe and grow over time depending on how they're used. Um, It it really feels pretty obvious that a rigid adherence to um, an absolute design standard for the kind of software projects that we are uh, engaged in um, will not allow us to grow and innovate. Um, But at the same time, we have to balance that against how it is often challenging to um, work with teams where there's particular uh, opinionated views based on individual preferences. And so we do rely um, at Red Hat on meeting this challenge by leaning on our research, our user research team, um, by using the Patternfly design system, and obviously being willing to discuss and work together in teams and evolve the, the standards over time. And then, of course, uh, the design system alone can't give you what you need. Um, the enterprise, when we talk about the enterprise, it's human at its core. Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, and this is an image showing us um, in a typical meeting. Well, maybe not so typical. We have a we have a, a, a special guest in that meeting, but. Um, We do spend a lot of time discussing, and because we're geographically distributed, we use online systems that allow us to to communicate um, in conference calls. And um, speaking about and talking about how to evolve products so that they will be more consistent. Um, So that is, as I've described, existing um, products uh, alone are challenging within Red Hat. But when a new company is acquired, uh, the challenge becomes even greater. And this is where I'd like to invite up my colleague Thomas, um, who is the UX lead and who is UX lead and manager with Red Hat Three Scale. API management, and 3Scale was acquired by Red Hat in 2016, and uh, Thomas is going to talk to you about some details and specific uh, challenges that his team faced uh, working together with us trying to integrate the 3Scale system with ours. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, um, Red Hat uh, Three Scale. Before they, before we were bought by Red Hat, um, uh, Three Scale started uh, in 2007. Was founded. I joined the company um, in 2013. And Red Hat bought us in 2017. So, so we joined as the ugly duckling. I'm, I'm aware this is not really a duckling, but you know this uh, image uh, was rights-free, so <laughs> I thought it was funny. And anyway, you know, as uh, ducklings always become beautiful swans, so it doesn't really matter. Um, 
But yeah, so we started, like our company was like pure SaaS. I'll give you a little bit of context. Like Threescale is about API management. So it's like our customers have an API and their customers uh, want to use their API. And we help them with everything around their API. So like um, have a developer portal, ask money for your for usage of your API, and manage the keys for the applications, et cetera, et cetera. And to have some context. So we were a SaaS only company. So our first year and a half uh, after Red Hat bought us was spent making an on-premises version uh, of our software. So we could at least also be sold as part of the OpenShift uh, package of, uh, of, integra- of, of the integration product. But still we were the, a little bit of the, like the ugly duckling in the sense that um, we look like this. Now we, we did our best there to integrate with Red Hat by just saying uh, free scale by Red Hat, very small. And that basically was it because we didn't have time for any, anything else at that moment in time. And until Amy saw that, no. Um, and, until basically the time was there, we like we had an on-prem product, it was working, and like you know, uh, we got feedback from sales, and like every time they showed Freescale, it was like the customer was like, okay, that looks like a different, completely different product. How's that? Well, so we needed to to integrate more with the rest uh, of of the integration product, which looked more or less like, for example, uh, Fuse. Now you could say, I mean, there, it's white and black, so that's that's good. There's some blue. That's good, but there is some things missing. Like, uh, so we have our like our navigation is horizontal there at the top, and our, we have some black bar, but it's thinner. We don't have our product name at the top. We have it underneath it, right? And so there were some other things. Like, this was our sign-in page at that moment. Uh, very minimalistic, and this was the Fuse signing page, and not just Fuse, also the other integration products, and they all ran within OpenShift, which also looked the same because it was also using Petterfly. So we had to get our product onto the Petterfly train with a limited uh, number of people, with a limited uh, time frame. You know, we couldn't just put. I mean, the Freescale application is it's like many, many, many pages. We don't have an official design system. We have, I mean, our code is not like one big chaos. There is organization to it, but there is no butterfly. There's no design system. So there are rules and there are things, but we have like things like to do, remove this crap, but be aware that you have to remove all the diff.write and similar shit, this kind of stuff. <laughs> so, you know, we had to be careful there. Um, so we, um, we're using Slim for the templating of the, of the HTML. Well, that's not a problem by itself. On the JavaScript front, we were, ha- we were also a little bit all over the place because we tried different things over, over, uh, over the years. Um, so we have some Java, normal JavaScript, we have some CoffeeScript, we have some ES6, and we even had some more things. So, okay, so we, we looked at it again. We thought, okay, some quick wins. We changed some colors. We thought, okay, the, the butterfly is using the full screen, so that's going to be like this. Okay, that, that was like, uh, that was not much work <laughs> to get that done. But then we still have this, had this problem of, okay, how are we gonna, how are we gonna switch to, what, 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 what should we try to do? What, what's possible to do within a minimum amount of time to make people feel, to make our customers, the Red Hat customers feel like they're using just yet another product of the integration uh, portfolio. Uh, so we thought, okay, the most in your face things are the navigation and the, and the sign in screen. So that's what we focused on. And so, but then, um, a little step back, like before that, we were already thinking about that our navigation, like I told you before, we do um, we do API management, and we, we started with customers that only had one API to manage, but like there were more and more customers with uh, lots of APIs to manage, and our navigation was problematic in the sense that if you go to your APIs, then you could, go, you could click on, your, on an individual API, but then if you'd want to have the analytics of that API, you'd have to go to analytics and then find that same API, you can imagine that, that kind of sucked. What we wanted was more of an API-driven navigation. So within an API space, you would be able to do everything related to that API. So uh, we already had um, conversations about that in 2016, um, but we just didn't have time to do anything with it at that moment. But what we decided to do was like combine that Panerfly vertical navigation with a pretty uh, deep reorganization of our navigation. And that's what we did. 
and that that's so we tried playing with that and this is still like the content is not really there um, but like to have an idea what that would look like because we had also two layers of navigation within Petterfly that would be like this and then we found out we have a problem we don't have um, breadcrumbs meaning that if you'd navigate to uh, in telegram here then that would disappear again so you would have like no the person being on that page would have no way of knowing where relative to the other pages he was in the system at that time, we also knew that Panfly 4 was going in a direction where there would also be vertical navigation, but the, the second layer would, would be underneath it, which would be better for us because it would be, always be visible. Um, we, we tried. We tried breadcrumbs, but that didn't work out. It was too much work. We couldn't do it, so we, 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 we closed it. We didn't merge it. Um, and we went here, right? So we, we borrowed a little bit of Panfly 4, having that navigation, that secondary la uh, layer underneath in the same vertical bar, always visible. So that's another like diversion that we did. Like there is no um, uh, what's it called a hamburger. You could not uh, like remove it because then the per uh, yeah these are our breadcrumbs basically. You know that was just be pragmatic about um, implementing Panfly. Okay, let me see. So that's what we did, and it worked out pretty well. Um, and we changed our sign-in page to look also more in line with the other products. And I have some takeaways. So that's what we did, like start with the most in-your-face differences and leave the rest for later. And the second one would be um, you know, that's also another thing. I'm, I'm not sure if this is valid for every project where that tries to, to um, adhere to a, to a visual standard, but we use that visual alignment to also actually make, make other more structural improvements to the product. So we could, when we launched this, we could tell our customers, you know, we, we made it different because this, this, and this, and this, and it's not just a, a different loop, but it, there's a reason to it behind it, and that helps. Um, in our, especially at the SaaS level, for our customers to appreciate the changes. Um, and, well, implement in spirit, not in letter. So, yeah, right, we, we should have had that hamburger icon. Uh, we should have, uh, if, if we would do it by the letter, it, it's not correct. There, there are, it's not pixel perfect, under five, three. At this moment, uh, it was not. Um, but that was not really our goal. Our goal was customers seeing one set of Red Hat products and uh, feel good about that, right? Oh, sorry, I'm going too fast. So then we thought we were done, and of course then the Panafly team came with Panafly 4, so we could still start all over again. No, uh, no. Then, then we had to find a way to, to get Panafly 4 to work. And that's where I give it back to Amy. Thank you. Right, so of course, then the next version came along. Um, and and we, similar to how Thomas decided to, um, instead of just adding the Patternfly 3 uh, UI elements on top of the design, instead of, uh, he actually rethought the, um, the IA of his application and where things belonged. We also expanded our project instead of just everybody moved to Pattern Fly 4. What we're really doing is expanding on um, not only 3Scale but other <clears throat> open source projects that are part of the Red Hat Agile integration um, product line. And so that includes um, Syndesis open source um, upstream project, which is Fuse Online, um, allowing you to easily create uh, integrations using camel routes. Epicurio, which is an API uh, editor. Three scale for API management and Kafka and ActiveMQ for messaging. Um, so our team, since uh, about February, I was looking at the document, we, um, the UXD team, along with some of the front-end developers from these various projects and products, um, have been meeting on a regular basis to talk about where are we now to sort of to get a lay of the land. Where is everyone in these projects in terms of Patternfly adoption and Patternfly 4 adoption in particular, and how can we all move in a, in a similar 
direction around the same time and around the same time frame. And so that team has been meeting. It's a virtual team from across the organization. Um, and we've uh, basically laid out kind of a roadmap for moving ahead. We have successfully um, migrated all of those applications that I mentioned to using the Patternfly 4 designs for their masthead, which is that header bar, the vertical navigation, the about page, and the logon page. So as Thomas said, um, the in-your-face parts of the system are what we commonly refer to as application Chrome. So it's the kind of surrounding pieces. So this particularly helps um, with demos. The sales team and the product teams really like this because if someone's demoing and they're just flashing things up in front of users and switching between, their users not necessarily, or, or the audience is not necessarily looking at all the details. So we figured if we do that first, we're kind of showing it's a good faith effort. We're moving in that direction. Now we're starting to dig into the content areas of the application. And so our next, um, the part that we're working on actually now is looking at lists, cards, and tables. Because what we noticed is that those three um, components are a, a good part, maybe almost 80% of, of what we show in those applications. Um, at the same time, we're looking at some kind of bespoke or unique elements from the different applications to determine can these things be contributed back to pattern fly? Are there patterns that are existing that could be better um, used instead of those and so on? And then as we move forward, we plan to look into even uh, additional content areas like toolbars, fonts. Um, there was a big font change from pattern fly 3 to pattern fly 4, uh, buttons, forms, and, and other, other uh, UI elements. Um, I wanted to show you a couple of examples of, um, you'll see the, the spirit of the, of the closeness of these, uh, if not the letter. Um, so this is three scale API management right now, the, a main page, um, and this is Red Hat Fuse Online. Um, as Thomas pointed out, there's no hamburger here. So we're not quite there yet, but we're moving in the same direction. The um, Red Hat logo is there. The the Red Hat uh, the Red Hat itself is there. Um, the menuing system and the masthead. Same with API Designer, which is part of Red Hat integration, and it doesn't have a left nav. This is just the welcome empty state page. And then these are a couple of examples of um, the about screen for Fuse Online. Red Hat API Designer and AMQ Console. I included a couple of links here at the end. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Patterfly 4 open source design system, um, please visit that link. There's lots of great information there. Um, you can contribute at that location, learn about uh, at contributing to, to the project. Um, there's a link here to the Figma survey that we that I discussed earlier, and also a design systems publication if you're interested in learning more about design or design systems um, that is there on the list as well. So thank you very much, and Thomas and I would be happy to take questions at this time. Thank you. If anyone has questions, I'd like to ask that you raise your hand and try to move toward the aisles if possible so that we can just quickly get the mic to you. Just uh, for clarification, one of the components you said was content guidelines. Can you elaborate on that? I'm a writer and content means one thing to me. I'm oh. not sure it means something different to you. Yes. Um, we do have content guidelines. Um, we have a um, content management um, a person on our staff um, of the UXD department who does um, a good bit of writing. And um, on the Patternfly site itself, which I'm not sure I can get to because of this crazy 
thing, um, but you can look it up. Um, the content guidelines include writing for UIs, um, how to, you know, things like voice, um, consistent voice, uh, terminology, things to avoid, um, that sort of thing. And um, they're pretty extensive. Uh, I think she did a great job. So um, if you haven't seen those yet, if you go to patternfly.org, um, to that last link that I included, um, which I guess I could try to do. There it is. That's not it. Writing, voice, and style guide. So feel free to explore those those parts of the website. Thanks for the question. Any others? If, uh, I have a question, if we can allow that. Um, so uh, you spoke a little bit about how code, uh, code artifacts are um, an increasingly important part of design systems, that people want to integrate more of that into their design systems, and that um, uh, having a common JavaScript framework is, is important to that. Um, I know that part of the transition from pattern fly 3 to pattern fly 4 was settling on a single design, a single uh, JavaScript uh, framework. Uh, I don't know if you could possibly speak more to the importance of that and how that ties in. Did you catch the... I'm not sure I caught all the details. I think you're asking about how we settled on React. The question, sorry, it was um, uh, how you settled on React and how um, how you determined that having that one framework um, as opposed to a few different frameworks was important. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not part of the Pennerfly team, so I, I don't, but I'd say that the core of Pennerfly is not really React. It's a separate, it's a separate um, GitHub repository, so like you can only use the HTML, CSS, and then yeah, I'm guessing that it, it's about like you want one effort to to be really good and not three different efforts to be like half half. And then you could still discuss if React is the right choice, and I'm sure there's people that would say yes, and there's people that would say no, and maybe five years from now, when Facebook is no longer here, it yeah. will be all different. I don't know. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that, and I think it... I mean, I don't know if there's someone for here from, from the Patternfly team who could speak to it more than I can. My impression is that it, it, it came down to a matter of re resources. Um, you know, we do have a, a design and development team um, dedicated to Patternfly, but again, there are only so many, and the need is great. So, um, And I think there was um, a good bit of surveying done in the beginning. Is that right, Rachel? Um, a good bit of surveying done um, across not only our enterprise, but across the industry, to kind of come to that agreement on React uh, as being kind of the gold standard framework. But again, like Thomas said, the core there's the core library, which contains all the HTML and CSS um, that is available to you. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.